I'm heading off by myself to the islands off the east coast of Africa. I have left behind Cape Town and I'm traveling overland through Mozambique and Malawi on my way to visit seven islands that run along the East African coastline. Ilia de Mozambique, Ibo, the Comores, Mafia, Zanzibar, Pemba and Lamu. The Swahili people who live on these islands have a history of being great travelers, sailing between the islands and mainland in their dhows. But first join me on my journey up to East Africa, where I plan to learn more about dhows and about Swahili culture, and to get a taste of life on these islands today. Well, as you can see, this is a real tropical downpour. It's been raining hard for the last half an hour, although it's calming down now. It's derived in the town of Tet, in between Zimbabwe and, and Malawi. So I've been traveling for 36 hours on the same bus from Maputo. So it's nice to have my own room and just chill out for a while. And I'm going to have a cold beer just now, once the water is switched on, which is, should be at about 5 o'clock. And I actually know a shower, which is going to be real nice. After passing through southern Malawi the next day, these bicycle taxis take me the last stretch to the Ilala steamer, which brings me across Lake Malawi to northern Mozambique. The Ilala leaves me at the village of Metangula, which becomes an unscheduled stop when I fall ill. After only 10 days of travel, I am down with Africa's biggest killer. I'm in Mapangula, which is in Mozambique. Uh, came down with malaria on Saturday. It's now Monday, doing a lot better, but still not great. <laughs> the chances of contracting malaria become very small indeed if one takes a good prophylaxis and covers up at night so as not to get bitten by mosquitoes. Five days later, and still medicated to the hilt, I take to the road leading east from Lake Malawi towards the Indian Ocean. It is here that I learn a new respect for Toyota diesel pickups, and our driver in particular, as he slips his clutch and hurtles the vehicle up steep excuses for roads. The route leads up the eastern escarpment of Africa's Great Rift Valley, an escape from the heat of the lakeside. In the town of Lashinga, I continue my recovery from malaria in a peaceful forest before continuing east. The final leg of my trip to the Indian Ocean Islands is an eight hour train ride across northern Mozambique, one of the last wild regions in Africa. The train ride is also a great opportunity to buy fresh produce at the different stops sometimes under the watchful eye of some of the world's more infamous characters. The word Swahili refers to both the language spoken in East Africa and it means people of the coast. And I intend meeting as many Swahili people as possible on the seven islands I'm visiting. Zanzibar is my first island, and it has an alluring history as former capital of the Omani Sultanate. But before delving a little into the island's past, my friend Andrew joins me, and together we begin the Dao investigation. <sighs> Yet another wild 
ride. This one could end in a ditch. I'm sure the camera can't make it out, but can you make out that little plant Little right there? here is the end of the Pemba. Tomorrow you're gonna pass it this way until Chitanga. <laughs> is, is it possible to see the mainland from here? At 25 kilometers away, it is too far to see mainland Africa from Zanzibar. While Andrew goes off on his own expedition, I meet up with a Dao builder. This village of Nungui, located on the northernmost tip of Zanzibar, is renowned for dial building. Ali and Quere is hard at work fashioning the local hardwood into a boat. He speaks little English and my Swahili is even more limited. But I read up on dials and I find it fascinating just how global these boats are. The same design is shared around the Western Indian Ocean Rim, between India, Arabia and East Africa. Across this vast region, methods of construction and rigging are the same but the latine cell is probably its most recognizable characteristic. Don't be misled by the tranquil setting. Ali sets a cracking pace. He builds a 20-foot dial in a mere three weeks. What is your job? My? What is your job? I'm a student. Yeah? Student? University. I leave Andrew behind on the beach and head back to Stone Town in search of more of Zanzibar's famous woodworkers. Getting lost in Stone Town's alleys is what a visit here is all about. The town is redolent in the history of the Swahili a people who have been a distinct coastal society with its own unique civilization for millennia. Operating out of a small workshop in the heart of the town's labyrinth of alleys, I meet Ahmada Yusuf, a door maker. Ahmada continues a family tradition of woodworkers passed down through the generations, and he fills me in on the history and craftsmanship of these doors. As you know, We've been colonized by Arabian from 1845 up to 1964, where we had blood revolution. So Arab took Indian to come Zanzibar working in a different business. Some of Indian were artists and they, from the time the image to walk on the woods and they, they found this type of doors which you can find them in every house in Stone Town. When we have business with the big doors, we take it to the friend who make joint. Normally they spend a week for the door of maybe five feet for seven. They can make it for week. Then they bring it to us, we cover it and we spend about two days. The common one is this doors. Everywhere you see the cavern, they have name. I give you two of the names. This one is Dama. From this, we have this one here called Lozi. And we, we have this design, we call them Majan in Kiswahili. Like this one. We call it Mnyororo. The large brass studs found on some of the doors originated as spike holders as protection from elephant raids during wars in India. Here on Zanzibar, they are merely decorative. 
The thought of lugging a seven-foot Zanzibar door home with me crosses my mind, but sanity prevails. It is time to leave behind Zanzibar with its skilled craftsmen, but a last supper with Andrew precedes my departure to the next island. I hope I don't see this food again tomorrow or tonight. What are you eating here, Andrew? I've got a healthy mix of rice, green bananas, beans, and spinach. Would you care for some meal? Yeah, my order is on its way. The bananas are actually they're quite nice. Mm-hmm. Back on the mainland, en route to island number two, I spend the night in the village of Mahate, in these rather charming quarters. After a showdown with the village black cat, I get in a few desultory hours sleep. Dawn comes early on Ilia de Mozambique. At half past four, I'm up to catch the sunrise and discover much activity. Ilia's fishermen are packing their dhows and setting sail. After seeing dhow construction on Zanzibar, I now watch as these unique boats, with their trusted design, set off for a day of fishing, proof of their enduring efficiency. Meanwhile, I take a stroll across the island. Once the Swahili trading center, Ilha de Mozambique subsequently became the capital of Portuguese East Africa for four centuries. Today it is known for its Creole culture and Portuguese architecture. The island boasts some of the oldest extant colonial buildings in the southern hemisphere in various states of repair and disrepair. On the northern tip of Ilha, is the fort of Saint Sebastian. It is from here that the Portuguese disrupted and took over the Swahili trade routes of this region four centuries ago. But coming from Cape Town, I find the following story particularly interesting. The fort of Saint Sebastian would have offered a bird's eye view in 1607 of a key battle between the occupying Portuguese and the invading Dutch who were looking for a base for their Dutch East India Company. Unable to capture the fort after two key battles, the Dutch, defeated, went south and founded what was to become the city of Cape Town instead. Walking through the fort, I'm struck by the magnitude of the structure. Walls over 20 meters high, whose every stone was shipped over from Portugal 500 years ago. Today the fort is derelict and overgrown with weeds. Only the ghost's hollow echoes speak of imperial bravado. While I spend the day exploring the fort, most of the fishermen of Ilia are out at sea in their dhows. But I come across these guys hauling in a load of fish just a stone's throw from the beach where their leaky dhow is being repaired. The island has a long history of dhow building, but today's work is simply a fix-up. A couple of new planks replace the reef-damaged hull. The Mozambican waters are being overfished by foreign trawlers, leading to dwindling fish stocks for the fishermen on islands like Ilya. Close to the shore, all that is edible are these small silverfish. I asked Zhao and his friends to show me the fish that are inedible.
Besha guidia. Besha besha mandeka. Arora. Biribiri. Biribiri. This is my fantastic room, 10,000 shillings, which equates to 10 US dollars. The benchmark in world currencies. So, in, with a, in by the sea in Tanga. I came here because I met three girls working for the United Nations on the boat across. And I thought I'd have a drink with them tonight and maybe I'll bump into them somewhere. Uh, it's quite possible. Everybody has a camera. Oh, wait, me too, me too. <laughs> <laughs> Weathermatic Dual 35. What else? Well, tell us about the functions. Well, the fun there's two lens selects. Can you hear it? Just two lenses. Oh. Uh, there's an underwater close-up button. I have no idea what it does. <laughs> That's a great picture. On Zanzibar Island, I learnt a little about its recent history under Arab domination. And on Ilia de Mozambique, I read up about the island's Portuguese imperialistic past, both of which contributed to the decline of the great Swahili trading era. By now I want to know who the Swahili people of Africa's east coast islands are. I do some reading while on Pemba Island and learn that the Swahili people, while never forming a strong political entity, have always been, in essence, traders. I decide to visit the Pemba markets. Ahmed Juba is the banana king of Pemba Island. His reputation is such that people travel from every corner of Pemba to attend his daily banana auction. Aside from Ahmed's business skills, I am amazed by the quality of the fruit and vegetables on Pemba Island. It truly is the most verdant and lush of all the islands I visit. I take a walk about and mingle with the Swahili of Pemba, who are in their element at the market. While the rest of the market is abuzz with activity, the Pemba baker is gradually eating away his profits. But white bread straight out of the oven beats even the freshest fruit, and I commiserate quietly behind my camera. Following monsoon winds, the Swahili traders of old traversed the Indian Ocean in their dhows, buying and selling. The Swahili dealt in commodities like ivory and timber, cloth and glass beads, sailing between the Middle East and Africa. Today the old slave and ivory markets are no more, but the Swahili trading heritage is still palpable in everyday life. Having watched the fishermen at work on Ilia de Mozambique, here on Pemba I am in time to see the dhows arrive back to terra firma and I visit a beach market where fishermen sell their fresh harvest. Like the banana auction, this is no quiet backwater market. This is a high-paced public sale where the buyers need to stay on their toes and the auctioneer waits for no one. Me 
Watching the rain come down on Pemba, lazily I remain horizontal indoors. The absence of television leaves my mind wandering, absent-mindedly concocting exotic travel plans. These wanderings are my entertainment. My imagination is my television. I've just reached the end of about three or four days in Dar es Salaam doing all the usual city things too much emailing and much of the real world so tomorrow I'm leaving and I'm going to Mafia Island for a week really looking forward to some peace and quiet My next island is peaceful and quiet. Although with people asking me if I'm Italian and hushed talk of oil money, I begin to wonder about the island's name, Mafia. The connection lies in my imagination as it turns out. The island is popular with Italian divers and the government has begun offshore oil exploration. I visit a local trader in the capital of Mafia, Kilindoni. As usual, my limited Swahili makes communication difficult, but Abdullah tries his best to explain what's on sale. Maharagi soya. Maharagi soya. Maharagi combat. Maharagi. They say uh, relations between Rwanda and France have become increasingly strained over allegations that Paris convened in the 1994 Rwanda genocide. Although oil exploration has begun on the island, it remains without telephones and with only a few vehicles. The discovery of oil could alter life here in the future, although given the exploitation of resources in Africa, I wonder if the people of Mafia will benefit from any newfound wealth. I find myself drawn back to the Daos, and I head down to the beach to see what Dao trading still takes place over here on Mafia. But first I hang out with the Dao cleaners. I sometimes flip the LCD screen around so that the subject can see himself with the due reaction of people unfamiliar with video cameras. <laughs> I watch the dark cleaners scrape the algae off the boat's hulls using coconut husks. If left, the algae will continue to grow and slow the dials down. Compared to Pemba Island with its small-scale beach fish market, the size of the dials here on Mafia seem to indicate a larger scale of trade. Indeed, the fish caught here is freshly frozen and packed for distant shores.
These dhows transport the fish caught off Mafia Island across to the mainland port city of Dar es Salaam. But the long distance dhow trade epoch is over. For more than a thousand years, Swahili traders used dhows to transport goods between East Africa and Arabia and as far away as India. Foreign traders and colonialists gradually eroded the Swahili merchant power. What trade there is today between Arabia and East Africa is done by air. Am I being invited to go diving with these French guys? Or what is it I'm being warned against? At this backpacker's lodge, my bag is stolen out of my tent. The only thing of value that is nicked is my tripod. But the local carpenter soon has a new one made for me so I can continue my journey to island number five. some of the haunted old buildings on Ebo Island. They really do feel haunted. It's like an eerie wind blowing through the trees all the time, even when there aren't trees. You never know what ghosts from the past might reappear. Old Portuguese soldiers or Arab traders or slave traders. Slaves, how many slaves must have been killed here? It's an amazing place because it's so run down and yet people are still living here. Ibo Island was a major slave trading post during the 18th and 19th century with demand from French sugar plantation owners on Mauritius and elsewhere. Following the end of the slave trade in the 19th century, the island gradually fell into obscurity the Portuguese colonial evacuation of 1975 marked the final loss of contact with the outside world. Today the island is gradually being rediscovered by a low level of tourism. The local industry on Ibo Island is the making of intricate silver jewellery whose origins lie in ancient Arabia. The first step is to stretch out the silver, which comes from melted coins. Thereafter, the silver is melted and worked into shape. And from there, these silversmiths create their designs. During the stretching out of the silver, the colour becomes darker. So in order to regain the bright luster, the jewellery is washed in a special boiling concoction containing lemon, water and salt. Following the washing, the jewellery is cleaned off with water and sand and is then ready to sell. Mm. 
I've never felt history so tangible before as on Ebo Island. That expression, if walls could talk, almost seems real here. And the silver jeweler is the very real vestige of more prosperous times. Now that I've explored this living ghost town, I move on again. Having investigated Dao building, its use by fishermen, marketeers and long-distance traders, it is time to enjoy a Dao ride myself. Being so far away from things I know and am accustomed to is what I enjoy most about travelling. The anonymity. Just another foreigner passing through. And not understanding the language makes everything seem that bit more removed. If I understood what people around me were saying, it would probably make the experience a little banal. And in time, one becomes more attuned to body language and tone of voice. And while there are the dusty, hot, tiring days on the road, there are other times, like an overnight dial ride on a placid Indian Ocean, that more than compensate. The Camorra's archipelago is the furthest distance from mainland East Africa of the islands I visit and has a unique feel about it with its own brand of Swahili culture. These three islands are also well known for their turbulent history of coup d'etats, sudden violent seizures of power from the government. But although it's easy to let one's imagination run right with images of French mercenaries staging government takeovers, in reality I find the Camorra's tranquil and the people friendly if reserved, well mostly. The world's largest active volcano, Kartala, is on Grand Comore Island one of the three islands that comprise the Comores. Together with a friend, Daryl, we hike up on an overnight trip to the volcano summit. A recent eruption on Kartala flung boulders and spewed ash and molten lava throughout the summit caldera and over Mount Kartala's sides. Gritty rain fell down on the mountain villages, rendering visibility zero. All life on the caldera was destroyed, leaving behind petrified forests and an eerie, desolate silence. It is only a couple of months after our overnight visit to the caldera that the volcano erupts again. From the heights of the tumultuous volcano, we head back down to the coastline, eventually making it back to the capital city, Moroni. A sad sight awaits us at the harbour. This Dao graveyard is the remnant of the Swahili Dao trade in the Comores. What we see here in Moroni is a very real example of the Moribund Swahili trading era. As I had read in the history books and seen on previous islands, 
The Swahili merchants had their power taken away from them, first by the Portuguese, later the Omani Arabs based in Zanzibar, then European companies and colonialists, and finally the independent East African states. These Moroni harbour workers are salvaging a boat. By sifting, cleaning and patching up, they hope to bring one of these carcasses back to life. The handful of sun-bleached boats kept afloat are for the purpose of harbour transportation. Large container ships have drafts too deep to allow them to enter the Moroni harbour. The Dow's final purpose here in the Comores is to transport goods between these huge vessels and the harbour. The Comores has seen over 20 coup d'etats since independence in 1975 and is today a fragile federation of three islands. The regular volcanic eruptions only add to the sense of tumultuousness. And it is here that I have a conclusive feeling of the changing fortunes of the Dows of East Africa. Back to travelling solo, I arrive on my penultimate island, Lamu, at the time of festivity. Every year the birth of the Prophet Muhammad is celebrated during the Maulidi festival, the biggest annual event on Lamu Island. Everyone helps with the preparations. The mosque painter decides to film me while I help him get the town's main Riyadh mosque in tip-top condition. It is one of over 20 active mosques in the small town of Lamu. After downbeat Comores, it is refreshing to arrive at an island in the midst of a festival, an energetic celebration of Islam and East Coast culture. Ah, I'm a daughter of celebration of Maulid, so welcome to Lamu to enjoy. Riyadh and Yangu. Wow, I'm a cool Riyadh and Yangu, now I'm I take the holy man's advice and promise to return later to the Riyadh Mosque. At the waterfront, I watch villagers from surrounding islands and the nearby mainland arriving to perform during the one-week festival, while pilgrims from throughout East Africa and beyond descend on Lamu for their festivities. For the devout, the Lamu Maulidi is so laden with blessing that some say two trips to Lamu are equal to one to Mecca in the eyes of God. Swaying gently to the beating rhythm of the drums, the Swahili of Lamu stage mock fights using sandals as shields. I find the event to be a fascinating spectacle especially as there are only a handful of tourists. I do some reading and discover that as in other parts of Africa, Swahili Islam is a fusion of traditional cultural elements and Orthodox Islam. The Maulidi festival is a unique East African event. In fact, the Prophet's birthday is not recognized as a legitimate public holiday by most Arab nations and is adamantly opposed by some, like Saudi Arabia. It seems the resilience of Maledi here is at least partly attributable to its core Swahili cultural elements. 
the introduction of musical instruments in sacred Islamic rituals as an example of breaking away from conventional Islam. The Swahili brand of Islam feels alive and visceral and older than anything I know. Races are taking place simultaneously. The ten finest stars have been chosen to compete and race through a complicated series of boys. Meanwhile, Lamu's best donkey jockeys, who have spent the entire year honing their skills, compete in the donkey races. I am relieved to see Dawas being used and celebrated. It gives me the feeling of hope for this symbol of the Swahili people. While the donkey races are a highlight on Lamu, donkeys being highly revered here, the Dawas impress me more. These boats of trusted old design have been turned into high-speed races. The skipper's girlfriend on the winning dial is French, so the tricolore flies proudly above the jubilant crew of Akram. On land, with everything short of spraying champagne, this being a Muslim festival, Suleiman Muhammad celebrates his donkey race win. At night time, I return again to the Riyada Mosque. I watch representatives from the village of Matondoni celebrate the Prophet's birth in their East African way, in this case, the Goma dance. The Matondoni villagers move slowly and meditatively in their shimmering white robes, a dance that requires stamina and self-discipline. Spectators pay respect to their favorite dancers by tucking Kenyan shilling notes into their embroidered koifa or hats and crowding around the group they like best. The group that has attracted the most spectators toward the end of the evening is deemed the winner. And it is the Matandoni group that go on to win at this year's Maulidi. Standing here, shooting these festivities, the realization hits me. My four month trip is almost over. My feelings are mixed. The excitement of the thought of returning home and the sadness of the end of another journey. I have visited beautiful places. I have watched a da'a being constructed in an amazingly quick three weeks. I've met the Swahili who continue to use their da'as to fish despite dwindling fish stocks. I've met the Swahili in their element at an auction, and I've met the merchants for whom the Dao has always been their trading tool. I've spent the night on a Dao on a tranquil Indian Ocean. In history books I've read how Swahili merchant power was gradually eroded by foreigners. And I've watched the Swahili in the midst of celebrating their unique culture that endures in the modern world. I have become more aware of my mortality after my brush with malaria. And as usual, I'm happiest when the wheels are turning. Another stint at the University of Life brings more respect for the different cultures of the world.
Despite the changing fortunes that time brings, the Swahili remain inextricably and powerfully bound together by religion, language, the spirit of entrepreneurship, and mostly the Dao, their line of communication between these islands. This is my hotel room, by the way, room number 18, Bahari Hotel. Pretty cool setup. My home. It's the longest I've stayed anywhere. I think I've been here 11 nights tonight. So I'm gonna have a shower now because I'm very sticky and smelly as I am most of the time here. And uh, who knows, possibly go for a last beer as well. It's not inconceivable that that will happen. And so I guess I'm signing out. This is a sad moment. Don't look back. Hold back the tears. Oh,